My name is Christopher Caliendo and welcome to the Flute Academy. And today we have an extraordinary guest, the legend himself, Mr. Sheridan Stokes, my dear friend for 30 years and the number one flute recording artist in the Hollywood studios for now over 50 years. Sheridan has performed with more famous Hollywood composers and on more different types of flute instruments on world music soundtracks more than anyone else that I know of. He's going to demonstrate those flutes today. He's also going to share with you those soundtracks he's performed on from an experience as a teacher at UCLA now about four 40 years as the teacher at UCLA. He's also an experienced publisher, having published some uh, seminal books in the flute publishing world, including The Illustrated Method for Flute in its fifth edition, I think. But we're also going to take a deep dive in another publication, Special Effects for Flute. And this is specific to world music, so stay tuned. But before that, we have an outstanding 2T special, an interview I did encapsulating this in his career in about four minutes, which will give you a nice overview of the person you're going to meet soon. Prepare for Mr. Sheridan Stokes. He's in our studio today, going live on the first World Music Flute Academy. Hello, my name is Christopher Caliendo, and welcome to 2T Talent. Today, I have the extreme honor of talking about one of my favorite flute players of all time. In fact, he's one of the greatest musicians I have ever had the pleasure of performing with or recording on numerous CDs and Hollywood film and television soundtracks. His name, Sheridan Stokes. He is a legend. But rather than me talking about Sheridan Stokes, let's have Sheridan Stokes talk to us through his art form, his flute playing. For example, on this recording of Modan on the Gypsy Americano CD. <laughs> Notice now the incredible and alluring flexibility and vibrato used in the opening bars of Tristezza on the CD Turbolino. or the inner rhythm of this fiery tango called Ardiente from the title cut from the CD. How easily Sheridan blends with the rhythmic complexities of this composition Enchanted Pilgrimage from the Chamber Jazz CD. Sheridan is constantly teaching me. His philosophy, very simple, never play the same piece of music twice. In fact, he makes an extreme effort never to do so. His color, his numerous approaches to vibrato, his gift of playing before and after the beat with exceptional musicality is the reason why he has been the number one flutist in Hollywood for over 50 years. Speaking of Hollywood, let's journey to an interview with Sheridan Stokes at the famous Capitol Records during the recording sessions of my score to The Iron Horse, a 20th Century Fox production. Lots and lots of notes and uh, it's a challenge to the player, but once you sort of get into it, then you serve, you rise to another level. It's, 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 it's fascinating. Your playing actually becomes better when the, when the score is difficult like it was today. And so uh, I enjoy it. I, I really enjoy having a challenge like this. My score to The Iron Horse is one of the most ambitious scores I have ever composed for Hollywood film. 35 of the greatest musicians in Hollywood got together for three long days to record over two hours of music at this level of complexity. Now I want you to listen to Sheridan Stokes simulate the attack of railroad workers by the Apache Indians. Your ear cannot help but navigate to his performance, a sudden burst of energy utilizing the shakuhashi attack as a special effect to evoke the arrival of the Indians. As 
professor of flute at UCLA Sheridan continues to share his legacy and experience with those fortunate students who get a chance to study with him. Now, together, Sheridan and I have published a method book based on how to play my tangos called Five Solo Flute Tangos. Let's listen to Sharon offer some of his insight on how to play the tango. Now, in this case, we're having a book on how to play tangos. And this particular book shows you the little distinctive characteristics of playing tangos. And people at any age can play a tango. A tango is not necessarily anything difficult. But you want to have the feel of the tango. You want to know what it's supposed to sound like. And the only way you're going to know that is to listen to tangos and see them, see the dancers dancing, because when you play, you want to have sort of a visual image of what you're doing. Tangos are very rhythmic, and they have different kinds of rhythms, and so learn to listen, learn to listen, and, and then exaggerate all the markings, and then the tangos that Christopher Caliendo wrote, he put in many markings, and those markings are in there for a reason. You want to follow them very, very carefully, but at the same time, go to the next step and be free and do what you want within a rhythmic context. Sheridan Stokes has won the Most Valuable Player Award from the National Academy of Performing Arts and Sciences numerous times. He recorded the original Mission Impossible theme for composer Lalo Schifrin, and John Williams' flute concerto was especially written for him. He has been professor of flute at UCLA for 37 years. Look for the sign, and thanks for listening. Sheridan Stokes, my dear friend and musical giant, congratulations on being our Tutti Talent featured artist. Sheridan, welcome to the studio. Uh, the first question I have for you, I'm just so curious. This flute seems to me uh, an instrument that has more special effects capabilities than any other instrument I know. How does it differ from its acoustical properties from other instruments, per se? Well, a flute is a jet edge system. You can take a piece of pipe or a Coke bottle or an old animal bone and if you, that's hollow uh, and blow across the end of it, and, and if you hit the edge, and you split the edge so that half the air goes in and half the air goes out approximately, you'll get a sound. It's a very, very simple way to produce sounds. And as a result, it's also very flexible. Flute is one of the most flexible instruments there is. And as I tell my students, playing the flute is much like the violin. The flute has keys. The violin players don't have keys and they have to tune every note. But the, on the flute, you have to tune every note too, just like you're playing the violin. You do have that flexibility on every single note. You can play very sharp, very flat, and, and, and that also is useful when you're doing special effects, being able to do that sort of thing. You know, Sheridan, you inspire a question and out of curiosity. The flute, again, has, unlike any other instrument, has so much variety. There are so many different types of flutes, and almost every country has their own type of flute. Unlike the trumpet, for example, which I, I mean, I'm at least not familiar to me. I don't know of an African trumpet as opposed to a Chinese trumpet or a South American trumpet, but the flute does. And uh, I just have to ask you, why do you think that's so? Well, in, in Asia, flutes are all over the place. You have the Chinese flute, and you have the Japanese shakuhachi. Uh, it's a very common Asian instrument. And then in Africa, you have the high flute, and you have the low flute, and they make a big distinction between this high and low flute. You, of course, in Europe, you have the flutes. I think the flute, probably more than any other instrument, is an international instrument. Okay, well, let's take a deep dive, and let's hear some of these instruments that you brought with us in the studio today. This is a bamboo flute. It's made in India and it's acoustically the same as any other flute, it has a beautiful sound and it's in the key of A. So I'll just play a few notes so you'll hear what it sounds like. This is a Sopranino recorder, but it sounds very much like 
a high African flute. There are two African flutes, basically, the high one and the low one, a rather low instrument. And they, and they have quite different qualities, obviously. So I'm going to play a few things on the Sopranino recorder, which is in the key of F. These are panpipes. They're used in South America, they're used in Europe. The famous Zamfir played the panpipes and he was an absolute genius on the panpipes. We did a recording session once at Paramount. They brought him all the way from Europe to play the panpipes. I couldn't believe how facile and how much he could get around the panpipes. It was quite incredible. But anyway, this is a panpipe. It's, it's nothing but a flute. Different length tubing. You go, blow across the end of the tubing just like a flute. So I'm going to play a few notes and you'll hear what it sounds like. This is a penny whistle, which everybody's heard about, mainly used in Irish music, but it can be used in many things. And I've played different kinds of pieces using the penny whistle. In Irish music, the penny whistle is very popular, and they have little ornaments. And if you know anything about playing Irish music, you don't tongue the music. Everything is with the breath, <laughs> like that. So I'm going to play a little bit to demonstrate what Irish music is like. But it doesn't have to be Irish, it could be something else. Now this is an Irish piccolo in the key of C. The penny whistle, the normal key is in the key of D, but they sound very much the same. The one major difference is on an Irish piccolo, you have a lot more flexibility. You can bend the tones, you can play better in tune. You, have, you can do things you can't do on a penny whistle. It has a slightly different sound, but not appreciably different. So I'm going to play it for you. You can, you can listen to it. And what kind of material is it made out of? You know, I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's some, some kind of wood. It's not plastic. It's a wooden instrument. And, it's, and they're very delicate. You have to be very careful of them. Okay. This is an Irish flute. It's an octave higher than an Irish piccolo. They're basically all in the key of D. The recorders, the flutes, the Renaissance flute, the Baroque flute, everything's sort of in the key of D. That's why Mozart wrote the D major flute concerto. Anyway, it's an Irish flute. It doesn't sound that much different than a Baroque flute or a Renaissance flute, but they're all, they all have their own characteristics. This is a Renaissance flute. 
and at first glance it doesn't look much different than the other flutes. But there's one major difference in this instrument. The, the inside bore doesn't taper. It's cylindrical, the same diameter from the beginning of the flute to the end of the flute, which means it's a louder instrument. And it was made to be played outdoors in Renaissance time. So let me play a few things for you. Now this is a Baroque flute, it's tuned the same as a Renaissance flute, except the taper inside the Baroque flute, it gets smaller at the end. And the Baroque flute was made to be played inside, as opposed to the Renaissance that was made to be played outside. Inside they wanted a softer sound, so that's why they designed the Baroque flute. Anyway, I'm going to play a little bit on the Baroque flute, which is a very flexible instrument. and It's capable of imitating lots of sounds, but I'll do something sort of Baroque-ish for you to listen to. This is an alto recorder and it was the favorite recorder of Baroque music. They thought it had the sweetest sound of all the recorders. So most Baroque music is written for alto recorder. It's a nice instrument. It has a, a lot of versatility. It can be used for other things. It can be used to imitate a wood flute. But it's a very, very pretty instrument. That was awesome, Sheridan. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to move now to your experience in Hollywood. I mean, you are sort of the unheralded hero. You're the, you're the recording artist behind the microphone as opposed to the stage artist live on stage, which you've done also and we will go into. But for now, uh, like I've said, you performed for over 50 years for more composers and provided your inconsummate knowledge of special effects and these different flutes you play from all over the world. Um, would you illustrate for us some of these famous some of the famous Hollywood soundtracks you performed on on these flutes and uh, talk about the special effects used and the composer that um, you provided them for? This is a penny whistle. It was used as the love theme from the movie Titanic. Uh, I didn't actually play the movie, but I played this on the Academy Awards with Celine Dion back in 1998. This is an alto recorder. I used it in the TV series Kung Fu to imitate a wood flute. The composer specifically asked for a recorder, not a wood flute. Uh, the composer was James Helms, a wonderful composer 
was a guitar player and it was the first major thing he ever did. Anyway, this is the alto recorder from the TV series Kung Fu starring David Carradine. I worked a score with John Barry, the famous film composer that won five Oscars and did all the James Bond movies. And he wanted an Afghan flute. He didn't know what it was, I didn't know what it was, and the two drummers that played with me didn't know what it was either. So the three of us, the two drummers, Emil Richards and the famous Shelley Mann, and I got together and we decided a fast tempo and a slow tempo, and they conceived a rhythmic pattern and I just started playing. Anyway, this is sort of what I did on the Afghan flute. This is a, a Baroque flute slash, in this case, Afghan flute. Well, I was working on the movie Rush Hour 3, and the composer was Lalo Schifrin. And he went into the recording booth and talked to the, the director of the movie, Brett Ratner. And Brett says, I want a different kind of sound. So Lalo comes out and says, he, play, he said, play for a few minutes, uh, Chinese flute. I'll tell you when to start and stop. And I said, what do you want? He says, you know what to do. I said, oh, OK. And so I quickly went through my pentatonic scales. There are three or four that you can use. And, and so I picked the scale and then I just started improvising. And you know, you can play a, a regular C acoustic flute like I have here, but you can make it sound different kinds of ways because it, it's, they're all the same. The sound is produced the same way. So that's sort of the scale that I use, so. I don't know about anybody else listening, you know, watching and listening out there, but uh, what you have just done with this music that probably doesn't have these markings in it, I mean, I've heard heavy breathing uh, at, at certain areas in the melodic art, bent notes, I've heard glissandi, I've had shakuhachi attacks, all to create this Asian effect on a transverse flute. Now, I'm just curious, I'm not a flutist, but I know a lot of flutists are listening right now. Can that be taught? I mean, can it be, is it a skill that's acquired? Uh, let us know. Well, I've been notes. I played various Chinese pieces and Japanese pieces. I bend the notes. Uh, I use different kinds of attacks. So, you know, in, in Japanese music, they use shakuhachi. Well, they do the same sort of thing in Chinese music. Uh, and I, and I listen to try to make it sound interesting. I mean, I don't really know what it authentically sounds like, and I don't think it really matters. Even if I'm playing a piece of Baroque music that was written in the 1600s. We don't know what it sounded like then, but what we can do is really trying to make it sound interesting. And that's what I do, doesn't matter what I, kind of music I'm playing. In the case of the, the Chinese music, uh, I just made up something. But oddly enough, when we were scoring this Rush Hour 3 at uh, uh, Sony Pictures, 
uh, one of the violinists was from Beijing, and when I got through playing, she came up to me and she said, that sounded very authentic. So I was pleased, even somebody from China liked it. So you never really know, you never know really what you're going to do. So the bottom line is you have to please yourself and make it sound good. You know, this may seem like a rhetorical question to you, but do you suffer at all from performance anxiety? I mean, what you do so innately, so easily, you've got a microphone in front of you, you're surrounded by musicians at, for instance, Capitol Records. We're talking tens and tens of thousands of dollars worth of studio time, musicians, peer pressure, anxiety. But do you suffer at all from that? And can you offer some insight uh, into the concept of performance anxiety for other people who are listening today? I did a paper once on performance anxiety. And, and we talked about well, something called the locus of control. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that. I worked with a psychiatrist. And, and the question that, in, that we have is, how much do we do that's influenced by outside sources? And how much do we do influenced by inside sources? And there's actually an exam you can take. And I was explaining it to somebody the other day, and I said, and it's an exam of, as opposed to other exams where you can figure out the answer real easy. But you don't do that. You try to instinctively say what you would say without analyzing. And it's a hard exam to take. And lots of people, it's, they're more influenced from the outside than the inside. And I always try to be more influenced from the inside, being aware of what's around me. You know, being a student at UCLA and, and having the joy of being under your guidance, mentorship, uh, you taught me to be, uh, uh, to be aware of my surroundings too by, by sh sharing these special effects uh, before I would go into the recording studio. And I was very fortunate to write the music to 20th Century Fox's The Iron Horse, which is the story of the Transcontinental Railroad, and, in the, and under Lincoln's tenure as president, all the immigrants that came in to build that railroad. So I had to write music uh, for German immigrants, Irish immigrants, Italian immigrants, Chinese immigrants, but also I had to capture the Indian, the Apache, that made it very difficult for those railroad workers. And you convinced me that a Japanese special effect called Shakahachi is very creative in emancipating what Indian music could sound like. And I'd love for you to demonstrate one of the cues that I wrote for you for the Iron Horse utilizing the Shakahachi attack, and then we'll fly in the actual cue, how it sounds in context with the film, with you surrounded by the orchestra. In there, and the Shakuhachi attack, if, if you know what the instrument is, it's a, it's a hollow tube, and you blow across the end of it. And the Japanese have a particular, peculiar way of playing the Shakuhachi. They have wide vibratos and different kinds of attacks and so forth. But the Shakuhachi attack is something like this. say chu one of my jazz friends he said he said I just say chu and but anyway I'm going to play a little bit of this solo here and uh, you'll hear that kind of attack <laughs> and anyway uh, I'm going to demonstrate from a the Iron Horse, a uh, little flute solo I played, and, uh, and uh, Christopher Caliendo, the composer, he wrote Shaka, which means Shaka Hachi. Fellow listeners and attendees of the World Music Academy, here is what it sounds like in context, the Shaka Hachi special effect capturing the warlike Apache Indian in 20th Century Fox's The Iron Horse. Sure, and let's, let's talk about glissando as a special effect. And as you know, there are a variety of them. And uh, perhaps you could demonstrate some for us and uh, offer some insight into how to perform the variety of glissandi. Okay, let me explain a basic difference. If you're doing a portamento or a glissando on a violin, you can just move your finger up and down the string. You can't do that on a flute. You have to simulate it on a flute. And what you do is you simulate it with the breathing I learned this from a jazz saxophone player, oddly enough, how he could simulate the sandals with his breathing. Now let me demonstrate. If I just fall off on a note without doing that, it sounds like a scale, doesn't it? But if I use the breathing, it sounds more like a glissando. And then if I bend into the note, 
plus the breathing, then I get even more of a glissando effect. So it's a little trick we use to make glissandos more effective. And also you can make them longer that way. So let me take a little bit here from a wonderful piece by Christopher Colliano called The Little Gypsy. It's for solo flute. My students at UCLA love this piece. They play it all the time. They use it for recitals. And it has these effects in it. It has uh, glissandos, it has shakuhachi sounds, it has various kinds of trills, which a trill, by the way, can be any speed and, and done in many different ways. So the trill is a fascinating thing to, to talk about. It's a subject all by itself. So I'm going to start the little gypsy here at the top. <laughs> trills and trills as a special effect. Could you elaborate more on that and more and specifically how you tune, how you think about tuning trills? Well trills are a subject matter in themselves. When they write a trill they don't tell you anything. They don't tell you how fast to do it. They don't tell you whether to start fast and go slow. They don't talk about the pitch of the trill. They don't talk about anything. They just say trill. So you have to make the trill interesting. And if you hear a recording, you hear some brilliant artist playing a Baroque piece, and when he gets to the trill, the, the, the trill is sort of almost a quarter tone, and it spoils the whole piece. Whenever you trill, you always have to tune to the top note of the trill. If you listen to a trill, the ear picks up the top of the trill. A lot of players don't know that. The same with vibrato. The ear picks up the top part of the vibrato. So if I were to play a trill, for instance, like a E to an F, You hear how, how, how flat that F is? In order to make that trill sound good, I have to roll out so I tune to the F. The E's going to be a little sharp, but that doesn't matter. What matters is the upper note. <laughs> then it sounds okay, as long as that F is the same pitch as everything else you're playing. Trills can be different speeds. <laughs> and they should be... Uh, thought of that way. You should never take a trill at any one particular speed. Experiment around and find out where it sounds the best. Well, I personally can think of no more famous trill than the beginning theme that you played the flute on to Lalo Schifrin's amazing Mission Impossible television score. And uh, it's, a, it's a series that, of course, started in 66. I think it ended in 1973 and featured the IMF, the Impossible Missions Force. And uh, I would love, I'm not, not just me, but the Fl World Music Flute Academy and all the attendees here would love to have an anecdote from that history on your beloved relationship with Lalo Schifrin. Okay, Mission Impossible, if you remember the show, it starts off with a match burning, and with the match burning you hear a trill. And then it goes into a rhythm s section, and then you come into the theme. <laughs> the idea of espionage is just such a remarkable piece of music. It's so well interpreted. Are you using shakuhachi at all? On the Maybe attack? a little bit. A little bit on the attack. I, I've, I've given lectures to, to groups, and I, I'll play the way that the Mission Impossible theme was written originally, and then what I did to it. And when I played it, and Lalo Schifrin called me to do the scoring session, I, I took a risk. I said, I'm, I, I don't know what he really wants. 
but he's a creative guy. I'm just going to play it my way and see if he likes it. And so that's what I did. So here's the, the way it's written, and here's the way I played it. That's the way it's written. And here's what I did to it. Now, Sheridan, I, 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 I'm beginning to believe without question that your name is becoming an adjective. You just stokeized it. You know, what you did, your contribution to that melody, your innate nature, I have to ask you, and I'm asking on behalf of the audience that's watching, can what you've just done so naturally be taught? Can it, can it be learned? I can't answer the question. I don't know. Uh, I, I grew up in a musical family, and from the time I was a little kid, music was all around me. I first started playing the viola when I was five, which I rather liked, but, but somehow six months later, I. I wasn't playing the viola anymore. I guess my mother and father didn't like it. But anyway, uh, I started playing the flute when I was eight and the piano when I was 10. I took composition lessons. I played the saxophone and the clarinet and jazz bands. I did all sorts of things. And I think that, that my background of playing in various groups and playing in symphonies just led me into trying all sorts of things, just being part of the whole culture of music. I want to believe that it could be acquired. Um just awareness. For instance, I read uh, Tony Bennett's autobiography, which is extraordinarily revealing. And he talks about in his younger days with Count Basie, he would listen to Count Basie's solo. And as we all know, he was kind of a minimalist in his improvisations, just a note here, a note here. And then he would jump on the piano like a giant sforzando. And if you listen to Tony Bennett, he incorporated that Count Basieism. There's, there's another man who deserves an adjective, uh, in that style into his voice. He would sing melodically and cantabile, and all of a sudden, boom, he would pronounce on a vocal and knock you over with it. So I want to believe that it can be acquired. I think that's what happens. The more exposure you have, the more things you do, the, first of all, the more interesting it gets. And the more interesting it gets, the more you want to make it interesting. You start with nothing, then you start creating as you go along, and it becomes fascinating. Sure, let's talk about uh, vibrato. Another special effect, something you've taught me over the many, many years, something that very few fl flutists I know are creative about. And uh, once I became a publisher, and, and so many flutists would perform my music, and I was giving master classes and listening to flutists from even young high school to advanced professionalism, I couldn't get over the lack of creative use of vibrato. Now, we worked on a score in 20th Century Fox called Lucky Star, and you would remember the film was based on a French gypsy community living in the mountains uh, in, in the Swiss Alps. And you, your exotic use of vibrato, whether it was wide or fast vibrato, uh, was extraordinary in capturing the exotic gypsy nature of this community. I'd love you to play an excerpt from that, the actual cue from the film, the opening cue, the opening theme. And then I will share with the audience uh, how it sounds in context with the harp and piano, which was basically a trio I used, uh, and, and just to show how effective and how important it is in performance practice to use and pay attention to the use of vibrato. memories. Well, let's now hear it in context. Here's Sheridan Stokes performing with harp and piano, the opening cue to 20th Century Fox's Lucky Star.
Now let's move from film and TV to theatrical music, where you have prepared a couple of pieces that uh, that you've enjoyed over the many years. You have a piece called My, I think, by the composer um, Fukushima. Let's talk about that. Well, this is a, a not a complicated piece, but it's very effective. You never know when people are going to like something. But they particularly like this piece, and I've played it in, uh, in solo performance. It's, part of, it's the second movement of a th three-movement piece for flute and orchestra, but this movement is just flute alone. And uh, it's, it's really sort of interesting, so I'm, and it has the various kinds of effects in it. So I'm going to play a little bit of the, of the uh, beginning of it. And for those of you in the audience who are not familiar with Sheridan Stokes as a composer, here is a piece called Wings that he composed and utilized many of his special effects. This is a piece called Wings for solo flute and it incorporates a lot of the uh, special effects that I use. Another composer that I think most adroitly uses the flute uh, in his contemporary music is the great Japanese composer Takamitsu. Uh, I'm curious, have you, did you ever get a chance to meet with him and work with him? Takamitsu was a phenomenal Japanese composer who I was very fortunate to meet and go through the piece voice with him before a concert that I played at the Caltech, California Institute of Technology, some years ago. And the piece looks like it's a bunch of gimmicks. You look at it and you got to sing and play and you do fall-offs and you do a whole variety of stuff. And it looks like who'd want to play that? But it's an amazing piece because I've given it to students, I've played it, and it is very dramatic. It has a wonderful effect on the audience. And he has a lot of, of, of vowels and words that he says and words to put, taper off into something else. It's very, various kinds of fall-offs. You name it, it's in that piece, but it works. It works beautifully. Now let's move to electronic devices. I know you've used them before to just enhance what you're doing, enhance the special effects. Uh, you mentioned an Echoplex when we were talking before doing the interview. Uh, can you talk more about that? The Echoplex is uh, nothing but a tape repeater. If you play a note, it'll repeat that note. So you can do it, you can repeat it one or two times or over and over. So if I go, and it'll, what it'll do, or if I go, it'll go. Any number of times I want to do it, two or three times, it'll go on in as long as you want it to go on, or it'll taper down to nothing. So it was a useful device. We used it for a while, but haven't used it many years. Uh, the recording engineers thought they knew better, so they decided they could do it in the booth. But the problem is it's 
It doesn't have that spontaneous sound that it does when you actually do it on stage. And then another device is uh, a ring modulator. Ring modulator is a sort of an interesting device. I never used it too much, but it was fun to play around with because whatever you'd feed into the ring modulator, all sorts of strange things would come out, and you never knew what it was going to be. Notes all over the place. But it reminds me of the time that I played a, a solo at the Hollywood Bowl, a piece by Pierre Boulez called Exposante Fix, and it had four soloists. They put, up, uh, put us up on platforms in the Hollywood Bowl, but it started off with about a 10-minute flute solo, and they imported a, an electronic device from Germany, and whatever I played, it went through this device, and I had no idea how it was coming back out to the audience. But it, the rig modulator is a little bit like that. It, it just has crazy sounds that come out when you play. And then there is the curious electronic instrument called the tone divider. Uh, famous composer Paul Shahara, who I've known for years, wrote a piece for bass flute and percussion. And it used what we call as a tone divider. If you put a note into the instrument, the note will come on an octave or two lower than what you play. Usually the octave below didn't work well, but two octaves below came out very clear. It's an electronic sound. It's not the sound of the instrument you're actually playing. So I used it in, in his piece for bass flute and percussion. And the, the bass flute predominates, but you get this, this undertone. It's pretty loud, actually, of, with the, with the uh, tone divider. And uh, so it, it, it sounds like two instruments playing at once, but you get the quality of the bass flute because it's the top instrument. Uh, it was used for quite a while, for, and then it, it uh, was not used anymore. A lot of these devices come and go. But for a while, I, I used to carry all these electronic instruments with me, no matter what recording session I went to, because you never knew when they were going to use them. You know, Sharon, one of the things we haven't talked about is this great country's pantheon of folk music. One of them, of course, is American jazz, which in itself has got so many different styles. Um, but let's just say you're in the recording studio and you're, you don't have the gift of improvisation and the composer would like you to improvise. Uh, what advice would you have for listeners today uh, when you're in this predicament? And how do you use, for instance, inflections to capture or mimic the music of uh, inspired improvisation? And a lot of these, these scores, especially things I've done recently, some of these cartoons, uh, have jazz inflections, and you have to play it differently than you do a, a traditional score. And you have to listen, and, and, and sometimes you're bending notes, sometimes you're changing the tone quality, and a lot of it's just rhythm, plain old jazz rhythm. Uh, but you have to be flexible and listen to what's going on in order to make it sound. So you're in that sort of gray area. You don't quite know what it is, but it's not written out, and you have to do it, and you have to make it sound good. So, Jerry, and how about an example of how you incorporate inflections to make jazz sound sound so good? You know, Sheridan, let's go back in time to 2000 when uh, Turner Classic Movies had commissioned me to compose the score for A Lady of Chance. And if you remember, uh, we used my chamber jazz ensemble, of which you were a member of for many years, uh, for the soundtrack, for the ensemble that was recorded. And you, all the notes were written. There was no, there were, there were solos, but they were written down. And you made that music sound so beautiful, like inspired jazz improvisation. I'd love to share a cue uh, with our audience today.
You know, another great example was uh, my score to Sony Pictures Major Dundee, where you came over my home with a canvas bag full of instruments, and I needed an instrument to capture the benevolent nature of the Pawnee Indian, and you pulled out the bass recorder. And I know you have it in the studio today. Would you give an example of uh, that cue where we use the bass recorder, and then once again I'll play it in context with the rest of the orchestra, with, with the rest of the orchestra, so the audience can enjoy it uh, in context. And here it is in context, Major Dundee, the Pawnee Indians. Now, Sheridan, I know noticed that you were motivated at some point in your career to publish a book on special effects, and it comes with a CD which illustrates the different special effects uh, via performance. Would you care to share with us, you know, the history of that book, why you were motivated to publish it, etc.? Well, like many things in life, they float around until you say, "I have to put it on a piece of paper," and and get these ideas on a piece of paper and organize my thoughts. Uh, I found I did that when I wrote my flute method, and then I did that with the special effects. What it has the, the, the effect uh, of getting rid of the thoughts in a very organized way, and uh, then I can move ahead on to the next thing. So in the special effects, I just put all these various things I do on paper. And so one of them, uh, I'll go through the book here, one of them was key vibrato. Now here's, here's one here, I'm just reading it off the book. So you can clearly hear the distinct two notes, but they're more like quarter tones. Quarter tones, by the way, are very fascinating. Quarter tones, if you take a quarter tone cluster, uh, five quarter tones in a row, and have five players play it and tune it very accurately, you'll get the most amazing sound. If you don't tune it, it's just a, a blur of sound. Okay, anyway, that is uh, the, the key vibrato. And uh, let's see, uh, quarter tone trill here. Uh, here's one. Okay, the next thing here is hollow tones. There are lots of different kinds of sounds you can get on a flute. Sometimes you have to just finger them. So here's one. This is a, an F sharp. So a normal F sharp would be... Totally different quality. And sometimes I can just do that on my own. I can play the F sharp changing the armature and get another effect. Here's an A. sharp. That's better. It's important to try to tune these things. You never know quite what you're going to get. Pitch variation of notes. You can take play any note, a quarter tone, higher, flatter, eighth note, eighth tone, higher, or flatter. You can do lots of things. And it's good to do it for many reasons. It's just good practice. Now, excuse me for a second, how does that enrich folk music? Uh, in general? Well, folk music has, has lots of different pitches. And the pitches are the thing that make, give the music a characteristic sound. If you took folk music and you played it perfectly in tune, it would sound ridiculous. That's true of a great singer. Even like if you took Frank Sinatra and, and you made him perfectly in tune, it would sound absurd. Because it, music is not meant to be sound that way. You want to hear different pitches and different sounds. Oh. Now let me go on to double and triple tones. Here is a double tone. A C and a D.
a C and an E flat. There are many of those. I put in my book the ones that work well. There's a book that was put out that showed 6,000 of them, but hardly any of them work. So I put the ones in my book that really work well. Uh, there are different kinds of accents you can use. You can use a key accent, a harmonic accent, sort of like a shakuhachi accent, a breath accent. There's a lot of breath. You can sing and go flutter or blowing accent. Different kinds of sounds and accents. It's fun to do. It's fun to do whatever kind of, whether it's jazz or contemporary music or whatever you're doing. And this book is available where, Sheridan? It's available at Flute World. Sheridan, uh, we're getting ready to wrap up here, but I wanted to ask this question, certainly at the benefit of those watching today. The young flutist, the flutist who's learning special effects uh, to incorporate into their, and broaden their performance horizons. What advice would you give the young flutist uh, learning special effects uh, to you know, enhance their performance practice? Well, I think that the main thing is to, to learn every conceivable technique and style of music that you can. You're not going to like them all. I have students that like certain kinds of music and not other kinds of music, but the main thing is to, is to learn the music and then decide later. Um, I had a student, I just saw him recently. He lives in, in Shanghai and he, he read my book many years ago, translated it into Chinese, came to study with me at UCLA. And he, and he did the Rodrigo Concerto, which is the, probably the most difficult piece ever written. And, uh, and he play, played it brilliantly, so I accepted him as a student, naturally. He got to uh, Los Angeles. He could hardly read Western music. Uh, he was, and so, but he was, he was a brilliant player. So what do I do to somebody like this? I, I said, I'm gonna do something he can do, and, which was contemporary music. And he ate it up. He played contemporary music better than any student I've ever had. And, uh, and then he, and he gradually learned Western music, learned to read it, and he did his master's thesis on the Mozart flute concerto with an orchestra. So it's possible to teach people things and have them keep their minds open. And I think that's what I try to do as a teacher. I try to, 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 uh, to open up the world to them, and it's up to them to decide what they're gonna do. But if I hadn't given this particular student uh, Ning Lu is his name, uh, the, the inspiration of the modern music, he wouldn't be doing what he's doing now. He lives in Shanghai. He used to teach at the conservatory, but he gave it up. He's a soloist all over China playing contemporary flute music, and he's better known than anybody else. And, uh, and I'm very happy that I introduced him to that. But this can, this can apply to anything. They could, they could be introduced to Baroque music or various other kinds of modern music or into jazz. doesn't matter, or they can get into writing. I've had students become good writers, but the main thing is to give them as much information as they can and, and, uh, and, and not focus on being the world's greatest flute player or the world's greatest this or that. Learn the information and decide as you go along. My dear friend, you, as I said, you would continue inspiring me, and you certainly have, and I'm sure on behalf of the, the attendees watching, thank you so much for your consummate gifts, uh, giving them to humanity, giving this to the recording industry. Uh, I can't thank you enough for being here and providing your time. I also want to uh, thank Flute World for sponsoring this interview as well. Uh, Mr. Stokes' publications, the CDs are available at Flute World, and we ask you to uh, go there for your resource for all things Sheridan Stokes, as well as his website, SheridanStokes.com. Sheridan, thanks again, my friend. Thank you, Christopher. I'm very honored to be a guest speaker at the Flute Academy. We have known each other for many years and played many, many different kinds of music. And to do this online where you reach out to the entire world, I think is just wonderful. Thank you very much for allowing me to be part of it. Register today at ChristopherCaliendo.com and get two world music publications for the price of one. That's right, select from our diverse catalog of world music, Tango Americano, Gypsy Americano, Flamenco Americano, Chamber Jazz, Western, Film, Sacred and Classical Jazz. Enjoy hundreds of performances from our YouTube channel to make your selection process easier. 
Register here, simply add your name and email, and enjoy our two-for-one forever sale from our entire catalog. A thank you to you for 25 years of Caliendo World Music.